All right, guys. My name is Brandon. I'm with Tower Engineering, and this is going to be the owner training for the cooling towers. As I'm sure most of you are aware. Uh, this is going to be a very informal training today. So if you have questions, um, you know, you're wondering about something, or you don't want to add anything, uh, feel free to go ahead and just jump in, and we'll just kind of keep this light and keep it conversational. Um, but basically, we're going to touch on several different things, um, such as what is a cooling tower, what's the function. And we're going to spend most of our time on the internal components and what's in your tower and how they apply and the maintenance of those. Uh, so what is a cooling tower? Well, a cooling tower, the basic function is to help in the heat exchange process with the chiller. So basically you have your chiller over here and it's tied in and it, kind of, it sends water out from the chiller at let's say 95 degrees. It sends it out to your tower, sends it through the piping system, over your fill media, the water comes down into the basin right here, sends it back to your chiller at let's say 85 degrees. And then so with the cooler water, it helps in the heat exchange process. Now why do we want to do this? Because it makes your chiller more efficient, saves you money. In a nutshell, that's just that's the essence of what we do and why we're doing it. Now with cooling towers, there's two basic types of cooling towers. There's what they call a closed loop and an open loop. A closed loop is uh, a type that has refrigerant. Most of the time it has what we call coils and you put a refrigerant, um, it can be any type of refrigerant from, you know, for different things like uh, I was talking with uh, one of the guys earlier said, uh, you know, uh, for a compressor, some use it in process cooling uh, and it's such as like your house, the air conditioning of your house a lot of times has a refrigerant in it and they'll use air most of the time to pull water across those. Those are called closed. Loop. Now those are not efficient in applications such as this because when you get larger cooling towers you would have to have a field of those um, just to get the cooling you need so those are those are okay in process cooling or small applications such as your house but in a large application like this they're just not they're not practical now the other type is an open loop now there's a couple different types of open loop and I've drawn a couple here for you um, this one and some of you may have seen this before is called a cross flow tower now, it's called this because your fill media is in this section right here. The water is sent right here, and the water trickles down through the fill media. And as it is, the fan's pulling it across it. Henceforth, you get the name cross flow. So the, it's pulling it across. Now, the other type is what you got, which is the concrete cooling tires you got up there, which are counter flow. Now, with this, the water is being put down across the fill media and your air is being pulled up against the water, that's why it's called a counterflow. Now the cross flow does work, but it's not near as efficient as the counterflow. The cross flow or the with the cross flow, the water's trickling down. So you don't get a consistent spread path. It's just however the water falls is how it falls. Well with the counterflow and with our tower we have what's called a gravity distribution system. So meaning we put a little pressure behind it. I mean, we, I'm sorry. This uses a gravity. We have a pressurized system in ours. So you put pressure behind it and it disperses the water evenly. Now why do we want to do that? Well, in cooling the water, you want to maximize your water to air ratio because then you're maximizing your thermal efficiency. The more time that the air spins around the, the more time the air spins on the surface area of the water, the cooler the water will become. So you want to maximize that amount of time. That's why we have the fill media that redirects it, splashes it back and forth, and then you're pulling air up against it. So you want to maximize the amount of uh, air and water transfer right there to maximize your cooling. So the counterflow is your most efficient method of cooling the water off. Now, um, there's uh, there's several different types of material like structural components of cooling towers. Probably the, the most common ones you all have seen are uh, metal towers, um, the metal and uh, fiberglass. And a lot of these are called package units uh, or even wood towers where they're, they're made primarily out of these materials. Now these are cheaper, uh, especially the wood and the metal, they require a lot more maintenance. Um, the other two type and the type that we do are fiberglass and concrete. Now fiberglass is good, it does have a it does have a life on the fiberglass, normally it's about 70 years, um, but it doesn't have the strength and some of the other characteristics like the concrete tower does. The concrete tower, um, you know, a lot of times they'll use them in seismic areas because the concrete 
is much stronger, has a lot stronger structural base to it, um, can take the loading, wind loading, can take the uh, structural seismic loads that are required. Uh, also concrete gives you the added benefit of a lot less maintenance. Uh, you don't have near the maintenance you do for uh, other types of towers. It has natural sound deadening properties, so most of the time they're much quieter. And it also has less vibration. And I don't know if, I don't know if y'all have any other types of metal or other types of towers out here, but if you ever walk on any of these towers, they have a lot more tendency to shake than these concrete ones will do. The concrete are much sturdier. So we, we prefer concrete, but we also do, uh, we also have fiberglass line. Um, you know, we've seen all the other kinds, and there's reasons for doing them, cost, cost reasons for other people using the other time, types um, and size. You know, there's, there's different things that play into it, but the type you have is a concrete tower, and it's, um, from a maintenance standpoint, that's a very good thing for y'all. Now, all the components in the cooling tower that we gave you uh, were designed per the engineer specification, the school's request, um, and they're custom design components for this tower to give the designed uh, cooling capacity that was requested. So this, this is not just a standard, okay, here's your box, you bought it, what you get is what you got. This is a, you know, this was designed around this application for you guys. So we're going to go ahead and start talking about the uh, internal components if nobody has any questions. Does the cooling tower for the new building cement then? It's a... Uh, the ones we did. I, I, I believe there were two different types of towers added. Um, the ones we, we provided are, uh, we added on to the existing, there was existing right, concrete tower there. at the other plant. And we had the other type up on the building. Probably yeah. On the other building, on the new building, you have a uh, a composite tower up there. They're Marley three cell towers, and you will be trained on that later okay. today. Okay. Right this morning, we're talking about the concrete Just tower. Just the one up there. Okay. okay. So we're starting on the internal components here. Um, first one we come to is your fill media. Now there are uh, two basic types of fill media. There's a ceramic block and a PVC fill. Uh, on this application, I believe you actually have the ceramic block. Um, the benefit of the ceramic block is that it lasts forever. I mean, it's just, it's basically like bricks. And, uh, you know, so they're, they're going to be around forever and they're very low value. So they have a very uh, low tendency to clog up. Uh, whereas the PVC, now the PVC is more efficient. If you're looking at these, you know, the, the tile fill is about right here, and you actually have the PVC, the efficiency is up here. But after 10 years, the efficiency of the PVC uh, dramatic, uh, dramatically drops off. But um, the PVC for the first 10 years is very efficient. Now, the, the tile block will maintain its uh, efficiency throughout most of its life, as long as you keep it clean. And you can actually pull that tile block out and power wash it off and open it up if it does get clogged. So there's, that's the benefit of, of the tile block is that it just, it lasts forever. Actually, and on that tile block, you know, we were talking uh, sets like bricks. When uh, they first started designing and developing these block tile, it was actually Acme Brick. I don't know if you've heard of them, they're down in our area, but Acme Brick actually was one of the first companies to try this. And they, they took, and they actually took their bricks and stacked them in a cooling tower. Now, unfortunately, there's so much static pressure, it couldn't pull enough air through, and it, you know, it, it just didn't work. But over time, they developed and they started getting different patterns and figured out what would work, and they came up with these block tiles that are widely used throughout the industry. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it's it's been a process. It's been years and years and years that they've been using these, and you know, the lifetime of them, the life, you know, it's just it. It outlasts PVC by far. Now, like I said, you don't get the upfront efficiency, but you do have to, over, over a period of time, you do have to change out the PVC or you do lose your thermal efficiency. Now, the next section up is our distribution system. We talked about this just a minute ago. I, you know, I mentioned how it's a pressurized system. Uh, you know, you do have some, some people or some companies that will use trickle systems that are like this. You don't find it often, though. Uh, most of the time it's a pressurized because you do want that even spread of water across the tower. Now, 
part of the reason for that is, say you're looking at it right here, and you don't have an even, even spread. You have some holes throughout it. Well, air, just like water, always seeks the path of least resistance. So if you've got a big hole, you're going to have a disproportionate amount of air go through that section of tower. So then you're not getting your air across your water, so you're decreasing your thermal efficiency. So that's one thing um, that we recommend you look for, and I know you have louvers on that tower over there, but in your inspections, you can actually take, the, take one panel louvers off, and we recommend that you look across the tower and you inspect what we call the rain zone, which is down here from the fill to the water. We, we recommend that you inspect that and see the water pattern because you should have a nice, even distribution across the entire tower. Uh, if you don't, if you look out there and you just see a column of water just pouring out, most often that means that you uh, have lost a uh, nozzle has come off or the cap on the nozzle has come off. Something's happened. Somebody stepped through and broke a lateral, you know, one of the PVC laterals. And so you'll have a huge column of water. Well, once again, air is not getting to all this water. So you're not cooling this water. So you're losing thermal efficiency. Same thing if you look out and you see a big dry area. You've got water coming all over here, but nothing coming through a section right there. Most of the, most of the time, that means you got a clog. Something got in your pipe system and it stopped up the nozzles. Um, we've seen everything from leaves to, I mean, all kinds of stuff get in there, plastic bags, and it can stop up your nozzles. Now, to, uh, when that happens, you need to, un need to unclog it because, once again, we're getting a huge amount of air through one little section and not across your tower, so it's decreasing the efficiency of your tower. Now, if you do get a clog nozzle or you have one that's pouring out, um, there's two ways to access this. In the drift illuminators, which we'll get to here in just a minute, we've provided an access door for you to get down in. Now, you can climb down in there and crawl across and find the nozzle and uh, fix it. Or the other way is you indicate kind of the section of the tower that you're looking and you're saying, okay, it's right, it's about halfway back on this side. So you climb up the tower and you can safely, there's a safe way to walk across these. We don't recommend it all the time, but I'll show you when we go up to the tower. You walk across, you indicate where it's at, and you can open up the drift eliminators right there, crawl down at that spot, and, and you fix that. Now, if it's a clog nozzle, and these are SFF nozzles, you just unscrew them, you take, and you'll take the nozzle and, and just dump the stuff out. Now, don't dump it in the field because it'll just get right back in your system. Take a bucket, a sack with you or something, dump it in that, put your nozzle back in, and a real quick change up. Now, the next section up is our drift eliminator. Now the drift eliminators serve two functions in this tower. One is we provided, it provides a platform to access your tower, uh, or to access your drive equipment within the tower. So, um, and that's laid upon the top of the drift eliminators to give you access. The, section, the second function is that it prevents all your water from shooting at the top of the tower. Now I don't know how, if any of you have ever been down in the tower down below here when it's running. Um, if you have, you go, if you get down there and you climb down there and see, um, the fan actually will suck water up. And I mean, I'm not talking a little bit of mist, I'm talking water droplets like this. You know, it's just pulling them up. And you've also probably seen it if you've ever seen one with broken, you know, a, a missing eliminator in there or something like that, or a gap like this. I mean, it'll suck water droplets, huge water droplets up. And if and if we didn't have those drift eliminators in there, it would look like it's raining outside of the tower. So, our drift eliminators are a three-way uh, three pass system. And basically how it works is air is coming up through. Well, as air comes up through the tower, I'll get over here so you guys can see this too. As air comes up, air comes up through these drift eliminators, it actually will impale it itself right here. The air slides around, but the water droplets drop back down. And at this point, these are very, very efficient. They've done enough research on them over the years, and they've made these you know, to the point where they're very efficient. Very little water gets passed. But that's how it works. It actually will impale itself. Now, one thing I will warn you about is on your water treatment, if you add a chemical called a surfactant in there, any type of surfactant, it can affect the uh, viability or the, the effectiveness of these drift eliminators. 
because the surfactant actually coats the exterior of the water and essentially changes the chemical property of the water. And so the water can no longer impale itself in these, but it just comes up and it just, it, it'll slide around just with the air. So you'll actually have water all inside the tower. And you'll, it'll look like it's raining. We've actually, we had a customer first time we ran into it. They called us up and said, it's raining outside our tower. You need to get up here. So we ran up to see what's going on. Everything was in place. Everything looked normal. But sure enough, I mean, it was, it looked like it was raining outside the tower, just soaked. And started digging into it, and they had changed their chemical property, their chemical treatment about three days before, and added a surfactant in. Well, a little bit of a surfactant is okay, but if you do it in excess, like I said, it coats the water, it changes the chemical property, so it, you know, it no longer uh, makes the drift eliminators you know, where they work. Uh, they, they can't do their function and stop that water, and so it just slides around with the air. So that's just something for you guys to be aware of. Now, moving ahead to the to the drive equipment. Now, this is a standard drive train, and with the drive train, we have first thing we have is our motor. The motor is uh, just a standard squirrel cage motor. Really, the only maintenance on it uh, is pretty straightforward and simple. You just got to grease the bearings. Um, the manufacturer recommends. Um, I believe it's every six months. Well, I'll double check on that for the maintenance schedule. Or right. it's either every six months or once a year. We've got that in our own MO. Look at that here in just a minute. But uh, that's really all you've got to do to the motor. Um, aside from checking the bolt tightness on all the uh, all the hardware tightness on all the drive equipment. But um, just like any motor, when you go to grease the bearings, take out the plug on the bottom. If you don't, you pump some grease in there. You can blow out the seal and or sh and shoot grease inside your motor and you have to send your motor out to a shop to have it fixed. So just make sure there's a plug on the bottom side, there's two grease ports, just make sure you take the take that out and take the plug out and you grease your bearings, you just want to grease it like you do when you want this full cage motor. Now coming off of the motor is a coupling. Now on this one we have a close coupling and basically these are uh, let me make sure I've got the right one here. And you'll have, you should have an, a copy of your OEM. And these are, and you'll see these in here, these are called Omega couplings. And these are a close coupling. And you see how they have this orange donut here. Now, this is beneficial to you guys because it'll tell you if anything's going wrong. These orange couplings, uh, they have flexibility to them. And that's on purpose because you want to have, this is moving machinery, and we want to have that little bit of play in there because if they're exact tight, you'd have the chance to tear it up, throw stuff around. They're not made, they're not based for that. You want that little bit of flexibility in these, just the way the cooling tire and the components work. So with the orange coupling, if something gets really misaligned though, these have a lot of flexibility to them. And so they'll take a lot of punishment for a long time. Uh, but you can, they'll tell you about it because these orange will start turning yellow, will start discoloring. So if this thing really gets distorted and gets kicked off to the side, um, or starts, you know, you know, twisting, anything like that, it'll start changing color on you. It'll tell you, hey, something's wrong here. So if you start seeing this thing look funny, being distorted, shaped, or colored, you need to pay attention to that and say, hey, we've got a problem here. We've got an alignment issue. We've got something's going wrong because this thing's not right. So that's something you need to be aware of when you're doing your walkthroughs looking at this. Is you need to look at these couplings and make sure make sure everything looks right. Make sure they're not distorted to the side. Um, see if they get a picture of it. One of our vendors does. I don't know if they do. Uh, it doesn't look here they do. But it, you'll actually see it. Instead of just being a round donut like that, just, it'll be actually, they'll kind of look like that. You know, so it'll actually kind of be warped, and it's actually very visible. Now that coupling connects us to our gearbox. The gearbox is the most maintenance intensive and also the most critical component that you're going to have to pay attention to in your cooling tower. Now inside the gearbox, it does have oil. <coughs> and just like the oil in the motor of your car, if you don't change it, you don't take care of it, you're going to blow it up. You're going to tear it up. So you've got to pay attention to that oil. 
Now we have provided a side glass on the outside of your uh, on the outside of the fan stack up there, so you can see what your oil level is. We do that for your convenience. There is a side glass actually on the gearbox that you can if all else fails, you can go in there and see what it is. But this side glass outside says oil levels here, and you know, okay, I, you know, okay, we're low, we're good, you know, how, whatever you see there. But it, if you go out there and you know it's this far below the line, you're going, hmm, that's not right. Now, when you're checking your oil level on the side glass, you want to make sure you check it when the fan is off. If the fan is on, there's actually an oil slinger plate inside this gearbox that takes the oil and throws it on the upper bearings as it's running. So if you check it while it's running, I mean that some of that oil is up and it hasn't all drained back down. So you need to turn the fan off, let it come down, let it set for several minutes, five, ten minutes, and then check it. Because if you check it while it's running, it's going to look low every time. So be aware of that. Now the oil, uh, the manufacturer recommends you change the oil every six months or 2,500 operating hours. And like I said, that's that's very critical. Um, there is also coming outside the tower, along with the side glass we have, there is a, another line, and that's your vent line. Uh, the vent line is so the gearbox can breathe. Uh, if you, we have had people where they don't, there's a little cap on it, a little vent cap to keep water out. You want to leave that open. Sometimes they shake. We've had people that didn't like it and they just taped them down or they um, changed it out and just put a plug in it. Well, the problem with that is, then you build up pressure when that gearbox, as the temperature rises and drops, and as it runs and heats up, you build up pressure in that gearbox and you can actually blow out your seals. So don't cap that, that's a vent cap. It's necessary for the operation of the gearbox. Now attached to the, attached to the gearbox is the motor. The motor, oh, sorry, not the motor. We were talking the motor. Attached to the gearbox is the fan. Now, the fan, there's really not a lot you need to do with it. Um, it shouldn't really change much. But it's a fiberglass composite fan. just sits directly on there. Um, we do ask, though, that you go and you check the pitch and the height of the blades because that can affect the balance of this fan. If you if, uh, say we mark right here, and I'll show you how to check this outside, but, you know, say you... Uh, you're checking your pitch and all your four of your fans track here and then all of a sudden you have one that's three inches lower well you can imagine that's going to throw off your balance so you want to make sure um, I think we recommend every three months that you go through and you check the tip height make sure just spin them around make sure they're all the same height and you want to check the pitch too and just make sure they're roughly I mean they don't have to be exact but just make sure they're close you don't want one like you don't want them all like this and then one dropped like this um, and that's just a function of the tightness of those bolts in the fan hose. And that is something we recommend that you check um, on a regular basis, is check the tightness of all these, um, all the mounting bolts, everything, because this is a mechanical system. It's an operating system, and there is vibration, there is movement, and things can loosen up. So we do recommend you go in, and the torque values are all in here. I think for all the mounting bolt tightness, it's like 125 foot-pounds. For the fan, I believe it's 85 foot-pounds for the fan hub. So we recommend you go in and check the uh, torque those. Just check the bolt tightness and make sure everything's staying tight. Because if it doesn't, you'll start getting vibration imbalances and you can tear stuff up. Now, also mounted on the gearbox, we have a vibration switch. Now, the vibration switch is there for the protection of the gearbox. Okay, it's for any catastrophic failure. It keeps it from just completely tearing everything up. Um, we ask that you do not wire around your vibration switch. We've had people do that. We had a customer call us and say, hey, my tower's not cooling. Like, What's, what do you mean it's not cooling? It's not cooling. So we went out there and we climbed up and our guy looked in and said, there's no fan blades in there. It's not going to cool with no fan blades. They had gone around and the, the fan, or somehow it was tripping. It was causing them problems. So they got tired, of, you know, instead of going and checking the problem, they went and they just wired around the vibration switch so they'd have to quit resetting. Well, apparently one night it was spinning around and a blade dropped, something happened, and one blade hit and it broke off and every blade behind it goes bam, 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 bam. Well, as it did, it started throwing those blades out. 
and they had blades in the street, they had blades in the parking lot. Luckily it was at night because, I mean, there were three blades on top of the parking garage. Um, they had one stuck down through the fill, they had one through the side of the fan stack. I mean, it was, I mean they were throwing fan blades everywhere. So. Um, we ask, do not wire around your vibration switch. It's protection for you, for other people, because if that vibration switch indicates something, you know, if it's tripping, that means there's a problem. Go check it. So, uh, and same thing, on the gearbox, there's a factory mounted oil level switch. This oil level switch is there for the protection of the gear. If that oil gets low, it's going to kick off. It tells you, hey, there's a problem here. You know, we need to add oil. And that's pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty obvious. Um, now one thing for you to watch, and we have had this happen, is we, uh, we got out to a tower, the tower would run for a while and then turn off. And then, so we'd go up there to climb up there to see what was wrong, and it'd start running again. And okay, it's running again, so we'd come back down and turn off, go back up there and turn off. And we did this for 30 minutes. Finally figured out what it was, was that oil level switch, the oil was just right on that edge right there. and so. They would start it up and run it, and that oil slinger plate would start throwing oil, and it would drop the oil level down, kill the gear, because it showed on low oil. By the time we got up there to check it out, the oil had drained back down, and the fan took off running. So that's just something for you to watch, keep an eye on. If you do see something like that, where it just keeps cutting on and off, on and off, that's just something we run into. So for something for you all as information. Now, um, are these, does anybody know, are these on VFD controllers? Yes, they are. Okay. With, a, with these gearboxes on a VFD, you want to make sure that um, the, uh, the level from 0 to 450 RPM, which is 0 to 15 hertz, is blocked out. Now, most of the time, most people block them out from 0 to 20 just to start off with anyway. But you want to make sure that that's set so that, the, so that this drive system will not operate below 15 RPM, I mean 15 hertz. Because if you do, that oil slinger plate does not work below that level. So uh, that can actually tear up your gear. And on the VFD, you want to make sure when you turn this on, you know, they have different X-cell and D-cell times. You don't want to operate. So you don't want a long lead time coming up through that. We recommend three to five seconds to get through that 15 hertz range. Because if you don't, the longer you operate there, the longer this gear is operating without a oil. Uh, now, also in VFDs, you have what's called resonant frequencies. Some of them are calculable, some of them are not calculable. We actually have some, we actually did have a calculable resonant frequency that we found uh, that should have been programmed in at 135 RPM. Uh, now that's, we recommend that be programmed in at plus or minus 10 RPM. And so that, that would end up on Hertz, it's going to end up being for you 243 I'm sorry, 24.3 through 25 hertz is just the block out range. And that's a calculable resonant frequency that we could find. Now, there may be others too. If you're running this tower and one day it operates and it's sitting there at 43 hertz, let's say, and all, you're standing there and all of a sudden, that, you know, it, all of a sudden this tower starts going rah, 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 making a huge racket. It sounds like it's about to come apart, shaking, all kinds of stuff. You can feel it. You're going, this isn't right. You know, try dropping the fan down a little bit. Say you're at 43, try dropping it down to 40 or taking it up to 50. And if it goes away, most of the time that's an indication of like a structural resonant frequency. So you can narrow that range and say, okay, well it does it between 42.5 and 44.9. And you want to block that range out. You do not want to operate the tower. Now, as the VFD is coming up, it'll actually go through that, it'll run through that range. And that's okay, just a short time through is fine. But you don't want to sit there and operate at that level because you'll tear up your equipment because that's a resonant frequency. And a lot of times these can't be determined till, uh, until you get in the field because even if you had all the information up front, a structural engineer did, had every piece of rebar laid out, did all the calculations, when they put it in in the field, if a guy moves a piece of rebar over one inch, it changes every calculation. So a lot of times these are just it's, you know, that's just something you have to say, oh, our tower does it. Most towers don't. But, I mean, we've seen it happen. We did a bank of 14 concrete cooling towers, exactly identical. Every one of them, and one of them in the middle, had a resonant frequency we had to block out. And, I mean, it was very predominant. It was very loud. I mean, it sounded like the thing was going to jump off its drive base and fall down. I mean, it just 
you could tell. So, I mean, it's just something you can't, you can't anticipate, it just happens. So if you ever run into that, that's what that is. So if you go up a little bit, down a little bit, and it drops out, find that range, narrow that range down a little bit, and find where it is, and you can put a block out of your drive so that it won't operate there and it won't damage your drive equipment. Now, um, we'll come back to this. We'll come back to the maintenance schedule here in just a sec. Um, but winter operation. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know. I mean, you're, you're up here, you're used to winter um, and how to operate your towers. But just to cover it, um, on the water side, you don't, you don't want to put water across multiple cells if you don't have to. You want to concentrate all your water in one cell. So if you can get the cooling you need by putting all your water in one of our cells, just put it across one on cell. Don't spread it across three and dr drastically drop the temperature of all three of those. So just, uh, you know, you want to put all your water together and uh, if you've got bypass, run it through bypass. Yes. Um, also on the air side, don't run your fans if you don't have to. Uh, we have a customer and uh, they have a package unit and they, they call us every year. They're up in Minnesota, and they call us every year saying, we froze up our tower. Inevitably, once a year, the, a plant guy will go off on the weekend and leave the tower running, and they have a cold snap, negative 20 come through, and they left the tower running, and they come in, and the, the entire thing's iced up. And so there are thaw procedures, but it's better for everything if you don't do that. So, uh, you know, if you don't have to run your fans, don't leave your fans running wide open. If you can get the cooling you need with the water across one cell and just running your fan at 50%, just do that. Don't just run everything wide open just because. So, I mean, really, you just want to maximize your heat load over the fewest number of cells. It's just the basic principle on winter operation. And like I said, I'm sure all you guys are familiar with this, but um, it's best to touch on it. Now, on our maintenance schedule, in our OM, we provided our recommended checklist uh, for maintenance as far as uh, time frames when we recommend everything. Now weekly, we recommend you check the gear for leaking seals, um, any, any leaking oil, oil levels. Um, we recommend you check the weekly, check the disc packs that we talked about that can warp and discolor because that's an alignment issue, it's very critical, so we recommend you check that. Um, also, just when you're up on the tower, just listen. Uh, for any unusual vibrations, noises. I mean, the tower, once you get used to it, you're around the tower, you'll know what's normal and what's not. And if something's going wrong, you can hear it. You can say, oh, that's, that doesn't sound right. That's not normal. That's not, you know, I'm not used to hearing that. So just listen to the tower when you're up there checking it out because it'll tell you if there's something wrong most of the time. Um, monthly, we recommend you check the water spray, like I talked about, taking the louver panel off and looking at the rain zone. That'll tell you if you have any clog nozzles or any, um, you know, broken nozzle, anything like that. Just make sure you have a nice, good spray pattern across the entire tower. Um, quarterly, we recommend you check the amp draw just to make sure everything's still, you know, operating like it should. Um, we also recommend that you check quarterly, check all the tightness for the bolts. So that's, you know, we talked about the different foot pound ratings. Those are in your O&Ms and the individual, but on, on the, the equipment mounting to the bases, we recommend 125 foot pounds on that. Um, and then every six months, you know, like we talked about, you need to change the oil or every 2,500 operating hours if it comes first. And also, um, the grease the bearing, it does look like they requ require that every six months on, from the manufacturer. So, uh, grease the bearings. And that's basically it. Anybody have any questions? We check the amp draw on the motor at the VFD instead of up in the tower. Uh, do you have a disconnect up on the tower? I think so, yeah. If you have a disconnect, I would. you can check it at the motor. I would probably check it at the disconnect if you don't. Um, a, lot of, a, a lot of places will not allow people <laughs> into the tower while the fan's running right. for safety reasons. So a lot of times checking the motor is not at the motor, or checking the amp draw at the motor is not really practical um, in a lot of a lot of facilities. 
So if you have to, um, check it at the uh, check it at the VFD, coming off the VFD. And if you check it, uh, and the thing is, if you check it quarterly and track it, you'll be able to see trending. If anything's going on, um, if you're starting to have problems, if you're having, you know, if, if there's any significant changes, you'll be able to see that. So that's really one of the main reasons that, you know, a lot of these uh, manufacturers want, want that information is because they want to see the trending of what's going on over time. Um, you know, uh, one of the VFD companies we work with, Valdor, that's one of the part of their step, a startup, is they want you to check, you know, the amp drop. They want the volts, amps, everything, when you first start it up. So they can compare that over time, and they know what they can kind of see what's going on. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I don't remember you introducing yourself at the very beginning. Could you do that? So yes. I can put that at the front. Okay. Okay. Yes, my name is Brandon, and I'm with Tower Engineering, and this is the owner training for the cooling towers. Okay. Yes, sir. Gear oil weight. What do you recommend on that? It is a 220 weight oil. 220. Yes, weight. sir. And if you look in the O and M, they actually have a page on the back where they have recommended manufacturers. And they actually tell you, um, they actually tell you the different you know, people you could buy from, whether it's Chevron, Conoco, Exxon, Mobile, Pennzoil, Shell, uh, all the major players. They and they tell you what kind of, and it's all 220 oil. Um, but they tell you all the ones, and then even if you want to go to synthetic. Um, now I'm sure you guys, I don't know if you guys are using synthetic or standard mineral oil. You we just use standard. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now you do, yeah. And I always. Uh, uh, Oil is mentioned, I like to touch on that because you do know, just like in your car, if you ever go to synthetic, you can't go back. Yeah. If you go to synthetic, you gotta stay with synthetic. So, uh, but if you're just using standard oil, yeah, there's a whole list of uh, the standard oil. If there's one on here y'all currently use for gearboxes um, that you wanna submit, you can send it to us. I'll give anybody that wants a card, I'll give you my card, you can email it to us, and we'll submit it to <coughs> Amarillo for approval. Um, without that, you know, the warranty doesn't apply if you're using an oil they don't, you know, that's not approved. But if you have a standard oil you use, we can submit it for approval and they'll take a look at it and, you know, tell, either tell us no and why or they'll say, yeah, that's an acceptable oil to use. Our two older towers up there, do they have the vibration switches and the oil switch and everything like this new one does? They should, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. They should have had the oil. The oil level comes from the manufacturer. Um, that's just pre, that's pretty standard. Unless somebody asks not to have it on there, is when we sell a tire. I don't know if that was something the new they added or what. No, the vibration switch. Um, I believe that may have come up during construction, and I, I believe it's it was added. Um, so I think they all do have it now. That was added under change order. They were there, but were not wired. Now they are. Okay. Are the vibration switches hardwired into the uh, emergency shutoff on the VFDs? They should be. I, I, we don't actually handle the wiring portion, so I couldn't tell you for sure. But what, how they should be wired in is that it's just a uh, it's just an open closed contactor, so that the signal is closed, and when that vibration switch trips off, it opens up, kills that circuit, and should at that point kill a stop circuit somehow on the VFD or the BMS system. Somehow it should be tied in. So when that thing dies, it kills everything. And I'm fairly certain we check that out at our startup. So it's not a program shutdown, it's a hard shutdown. Right, it actually, when it happens, it just opens up a circuit and kills everything. And that's how you want it. And now with the vibration switch, we did provide a remote reset button. That's a button that's set on the outside of the tower. And that's so that you don't have to climb down into the tower to reset the vibration switch. This makes it this makes it easier for you, so that you can just push it. Now we put it up on the tower because we don't want you sitting in an office sitting there going, "Well, this thing won't run," and it keeps tripping. You just keep hitting the button and thinks that they're going whack, 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 whack. So no, I don't know. Not everybody would do that, but we've been places where they would. So it's a safety feature for you because we want you to go up there and look at it. And go, why did this thing trip off? And push the button. 
So, but there is a reset button, so you don't have to climb down, and you can just push that, and it will reset the operation switch for you without having to climb inside. Yes. What's the best way to check if our cooling tower heaters are working, or if they're not? The only way we've done it is by amp drawn. I don't know if that's the right way. Um, most of the time it is. If, you're, if your basin heaters are properly rated the, for the proper KW, uh, you can just check that uh, and ohm it out. Just, just see if, you're, you know, if, it's, if it's working, if it's sitting there going through, you can check and see if it's got connectivity going through that circuit. And all it is, with basin heaters, they're just a heat transfer. Um, if it's the same type that we use, it's got a coil running through it, and um, then it's got some packing around and a sheath on the outside. It's just a heat transfer process. So as long as you've got connectivity going through that thing, and your thermostat's properly, you know, the the, what, the heater's properly sized and the thermostat's working, you know, they're going to be working as long as you've got connectivity going through. Any other questions? Okay, well, we will take this outside for anybody that wants to go outside in the cold. And um, we'll go walk on the tower and look at a couple of things we talked about. Um, I'll show you a couple of things and then um, that should conclude the train. All right, so out here at the cooling tower, um, these are the louver sections I was talking about earlier the, to take off to look. And we've got one conveniently open for us to look inside. This is the rain zone I was talking about. From the bottom of the fill, which is right there, coming down to the water right here. And that's the that's what we call the rain zone. So if you look out there and you see a big open spot where no water's falling, or you see just a big column of water down, that's an indication like we talked about in the nozzle. Uh, now these right here, over here, are the block tile that are, that are in there. That's a, just a sample of um, some of the pieces you know, if you ever had one break, but like I said, these things are, you can fill them, they're just ceramic. They're like bricks. And those are just a couple replacements we had just to, we left you guys here. But that's what's in here for your fill media. Um, if you ever have to take any out, just know there is a spacing stack pattern for these. So you can't just take them out and stick them back in. If the tower won't operate properly if you, if you do that. Now, um, I guess from this point, let's go up and look at some of the components up inside the tower. Okay, so just to recap what we discussed up on top, uh, we've looked at different things such as where the grease ports were located on the motors. Uh, we looked at where the side glass was and the level on it and the vent line coming outside. Uh, one thing we did, to, uh, I did point out was how to uh, feel, verify the uh, pitch of the blades without actually having to have a spark level or protract, digital protractor out there. And the easiest way is in the field, you have your blades coming down like this, just take a permanent marker up there and mark the pitch of the blade. That shows you the height and the pitch. The height can be plus or minus an inch, and the pitch can be with plus or minus two thousandths of a degree. So it doesn't have to be exact, it just needs to be close. So as you're spinning this around, you may have a blade that's right here like this, and the next one may just be, you know, a quarter inch lower, that's fine. Uh, or, you know, Higher. You just want it close on pitch and close on height so you don't have uh, any vibration issues. We also talked how to walk across the eliminator safely, and that is uh, the eliminators are supported by fiberglass supports underneath. You can see the run uh, underneath the spacing, and there's a fiberglass piece right there. You want to make sure you step on the fiberglass pieces as you're stepping across. It's just a four foot step, so it's not that hard. You just step across, that's a safe way because you don't. Those drip eliminators are not made to support people. Uh, now, when accessing the fill, uh, or accessing the piping in the fill, you can actually, I showed how to reach your hands in, find where two drip eliminator bundles come together, just reach your hands in the holes and pull up, and they'll separate. They separate and open up, you can get down in there. The, for the nozzle, you just twist it off, you can take it up and out, just stick it back on, twist it on, and then when you go to put the bundles back, they have curves, one curves in, one curves out. Just put those curves together and just push down and they slide in place. And they'll just pop back in. And uh, I think that's about the extent of everything we discussed and reviewed up there. We also looked at where the switches were located and what they did. But there's really nothing you should have to do to the whole level or operations.